Welcome to the Vertical Church Podcast. Now here's Pastor Josh Butcher with today's message. You know, they say Christmas is the, uh, the most wonderful time of the year. Um, the, you know, the, what's the song? The kids are jingle belling and everyone's telling you be of good cheer, right? Like, that's great. Like, I love Christmas. I love, I love, I love all Christmas songs. We were in a long line yesterday and I just started singing Christmas songs. And I was hoping it was going to be one of those times where like everybody, like an elf, you know, like when everybody breaks out and just starts singing Christmas carols together. It never happened because everybody was so frustrated at being in such a long line. But anyway, um, it's the most wonderful time of the year, but it's also the most complicated time of the year. Uh, Christmas, man, Christmas can get complicated. Let me tell you, when you get, especially as you get older, uh, Christmas can even be more complicated as you have kids, you know, because because when it's just you or maybe like you and a spouse, like people don't really care where you go spend Christmas. But then when you start having kids, then like grandma, grandpa, they want to see the kids. They want to celebrate Christmas. And so it just, Christmas can be complicated. You know, you got, you got kids, you got people coming to your house that you don't really like. You know, it's like, it's complicated. I don't, I don't really want to spend this holiday with you, but it's all right. Um, and I'm convinced, please don't like start throwing anything at me, but I am convinced that Christmas is more complicated for men than it is for women, particularly men who are husbands. Now, let me, let me just, let me unpack that. Okay. Here's why it's more complicated for us because wives lie. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you exactly how it goes, all right? A month ago, fellas, you had this conversation with your wife. Hey, um, I'm just wondering, like, what, do you, what, what would you like for Christmas? And here's what she said. Oh, I'm, I, I don't know, whatever. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, just, you know, I, I don't need anything. Fellas, if your wife wakes up on Christmas morning and she doesn't have anything under that tree... Jesus said in 2 Matthew chapter 17, woe unto the husband who believes that lie. Don't believe that lie. You better have something under there. So it's more complicated for us. It, family dynamics make it complicated. Uh, you know, you, you, got, you got to decide, you know, his family, her family, you got to kind of sort that out. Some of you in the room are newlyweds. You've got that to figure out this year. God bless you. I, I hope things go well for you today. Um, so you got to kind of figure that out. And then, if, like, in my family, my parents got divorced, and so then you've got to start deciding, like, well, okay, you got, you got, you got his dad and his dad's new girlfriend who can't be in the same room as his mom and her husband who can't, you know, so you got, like, that adds a whole layer of complication to it. Um, Christmas in the Butcher family is totally uncomplicated. It's incredibly simple. We spend Christmas with Hope's family. <laughs> it works out. It's not complicated. But the truth is, like, for me, like, uh, my childhood family, like, my immediate family, childhood family, I'm the only one that's left. Like, I'm not trying to, trying to make you feel sad or, or for me or anything, but, you know, my, my, my dad's already passed away. My mom's passed away. My only brother's passed away. So it's just me. And so it's easy for us. We just go to Hope's family's place, and, and we have a great time. And so that may not be your story, though. You may be heading into a week where it's really complicated, and you're trying to figure all that out. And here's the thing. I wish I had a magic wand that I could just, you know, uh, what would we say? Uh, I'll, uh, abracadabra, ho, 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 and everything would be fine. <laughs> and it all just work out. The schedule would work out. The shopping, the family, all of that would just uncomplicate itself. But I don't have that. Um, I, don't, I, I don't have that ability. And so Christmas... Christmas is complicated. The one place where Christmas is not complicated is the message of Christmas. In fact, the message of Christmas is so simple. Everybody, no matter if, you've, no matter if you grew up in church or this is the first time you've been in church in years, the message of Christmas is in, incredibly simple. We see it displayed in people's yards. We see it displayed uh, as we drive around looking at Christmas lights. It's the nativity, right? It's, it's Mary and Joseph, and, and usually there are some shepherds there and sheep, and people who don't know anything about the Bible put the wise men there, but they weren't there, but it's cool because we love you anyway. And so I've preached, I've preached the wise men at Christmas. It's fine. Get over your theological self. But anyway, you've got them there. And, of course, right in the middle where he belongs is baby Jesus. Right? Like he's, he's hanging out there. And that's where he, he's meant to be in the center of it all. In fact, 
uh, Luke. Uh, Luke really gives us a great uh, portrait of the first hours and day, the, the whole the whole beginning story of Jesus. And so, because I want to I want to uncomplicate Christmas. That's kind of the title of today's message: uncomplicating <laughs> Christmas. I'm only going to read to you two verses from Luke and one verse from John. Two verses from Luke, one verse from John. Here's Luke chapter two, verses ten through eleven. This is the the, the announcement. The angel makes to the shepherd. Check this out. The angel says this to the shepherds. On that first night, as Jesus is being born, over in a cave somewhere in Bethlehem, close by there are some shepherds, and this is what the angel says. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. The, the, angel, says, the angel says, I've come to give you good news and that good news will result in great joy for everybody who hears it. Nobody will get left out. This is, this is an all skate. Everybody participates. And the angel says, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Now, I don't know how you respond when somebody tells you good news. When, you know, like somebody will send you a text and say, hey, I've got good news, right? Or like, like somebody will stop you, maybe at work, and you're walking down the hallway trying to go to the bathroom, and they'll stop you, and they'll say, hey, I've got some good news. Now, typically, you don't respond with like an eye roll, <sighs> unless, unless you've got a problem, and you probably need to repent tonight. Anyway, um, and you probably don't respond with, okay, well, how much is this going to cost me, right? <laughs> unless they're carrying like a, a, a Girl Scout form with them, then you know it's going to cost you a lot. But typically when somebody says, hey, I've got great news, our typical response is, well, that's awesome. What is it? Like, like tell me, what, what, what is this great news that you have? What's this good news? Uh, let, me, let me just pause right here. If there's anything about Christmas that doesn't strike you as good news, then somewhere along the way, somewhere in your history, somewhere in your past, someone has complicated Christmas. And in fact, I'll take it a step forward. If there's anything about Christianity, if there's anything about Jesus, if, if, if there's anything about church that doesn't strike you as good news, then somewhere, someone along the way has distorted the message, has distorted the meaning, has twisted it into something that it's not. Because the angel says, hey, shepherds, listen, here's the deal. This is good news news, good news that'll cause great joy. So what is, what is good news? Well, good news is certainly not, you know, you got to straighten up, right? That's not good news. That's not even new news. Like religions all over the span of human history have preached that message. You got to clean yourself up. You got to get right. You got to follow this code of conduct. You got to get all of your stuff in a row and God will accept you. Well, that's not good news. That's not, it's not even new. That's as old as time. And, and, and good news is certainly also not like you got to get back in church. Now, I think church is important. I think church is vital. I think, that, I think that church is essential to your relationship with Jesus, but that's not good news. Think about it. The shepherds didn't have a church to go to. They, they, didn't, have any, they didn't have a church to go to. They didn't have a pastor to report to. So, so what is good news? Well, he, he, here's what I want you to remember today. Here's, here's what Christmas is all about. Christmas is all about the giver, the gift, and the response. We've been in a series here at, uh, here at Vertical uh, called, Do You See What I See? Uh, and we've looked at Christmas from different people, from the shepherds. We asked them, well, what do you think about that? We looked at it from Elizabeth's perspective. Like, do you see what, what I see? And today, here's what I want to do. I just want to give the microphone to God and say, God, what do you see? Like, what is Christmas all about to you? And I think God would tell us, well, Christmas is about the giver, the gift, and the response. The, the first one, Christmas is all about the giver. Now, uh, there are different kinds of gift givers, right? Like, let's just do a survey real quick. Uh, the first one, there, there's the re-gifter. How many in the room have re-gifted something? Be honest, Jesus is watching you. <laughs> God, Lord. Man, that's rough. 
Regifting, that's when somebody gives you something and you got to kind of go through that awkward excitement. Oh, thanks. Thank you. This is exactly what I wanted, right? Jesus, forgive me for lying. All right. And then you set it aside and you're thinking about that person whose birthday is coming up that you're going to give this to, right? So it's regifting. So there are regifters. Uh, there are there are me gifters. I don't know if you know what a me gifter is. A me gifter is somebody who's trying to buy something for for somebody, friend, a spouse, a, a parent, brother, sister, something like that. And and they don't know like they're trying to come up with something. They don't know what to get. So they ask this question. Well, what would I want? And then they end up buying a gift, not for the other person. But for themselves. Now, you think like that has never happened, but I have a friend, seriously, who this happened to his parents. His dad was trying to figure out what to get his mom for Christmas. And he, could, he, couldn't, he didn't come up with anything. He's like, I, I don't know. And so he thought, well, what would I want? And it hit him. And Christmas morning, mom woke up, opened up the, 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 the present under the tree, and right there in the box was a brand new shotgun. <laughs> exactly what mom wanted, right? No. That's what dad wanted. And he just thought because he wanted it, she would want it. True story, true story. Uh, another kind of gifter. Uh, there's the gag gifter, right? Like, you know, Dirty Santa, White Elephant, those kind of Christmas party games. And, and those gifts, those gifts aren't even about the person you're giving them to. You're, you choose the gift because you want an experience for the whole group, you know? Like, you don't buy it for the person. You buy it for everybody else, you know? Um, I, I saw on Amazon, I was looking for some gag gifts recently. I saw um, there's, there's this hat. It's a trucker hat, and it says IP in pools. I thought, that's awesome. <laughs> like, that's exactly what, like, that's my next gag gift. Whenever I have to do it again, white elephant, whatever, that's what I'm getting, IP in pools. So. <laughs> but, then, but then there's another kind of gift. There's another kind of gift. And when you get this gift, um, I don't even have a name for it. Um, you, you get this gift and you open it up and the gift is so thoughtful. It's, it's so tailored and intentional to your personality. It's as if the person went on Amazon and read your wish list, you know? It's like, this is, this is exactly what I want. And you love it as soon as you see it. It doesn't have to be expensive. You know, it's not always something expensive. It's just like, he took the time or... Or she took the time to, to get me exactly what I want, you know? And it causes you to love the giver so much more. It causes you to, it, it, it pulls you toward the giver. Have you ever received a gift like that? You know what I'm talking about? Like it's just, it's exact, like it's tailor-made for you. Well, it's those kinds of gifts that, that actually point us in the direction of the heart of God. Because that's the kind of gift giver that God is. In fact, John, uh, one of the early disciples of Jesus, and actually I'm just going to take this off because I think that will help me out a little bit. Whoa, that makes a difference. Whew. Don't leave that back there. Um, I'm sweating. Whew. All right, so uh, John, one of the early followers of Jesus. Hey, hey, Alan, this thing is driving me nuts. And I think everybody's getting tired of me messing with it, and I think it's my sweat. Could you bring me up a microphone? I appreciate that so much, man. Um, so John, one of the early followers of Jesus, uh, who's actually an eyewitness to uh, the life of Jesus. He was there. He watched Jesus ministry, watched Jesus heal people. Uh, he was there when Jesus fed the 5,000. He was there when Jesus was raising people out of the grave. And uh, he's an older man, and he's writing uh, the, the story of Jesus. He's writing down this story, and he records a conversation that Jesus had with a guy named Nicod Nicodemus. Thanks. Y'all cover your ears for a second. Okay. I just tossed it behind me. That didn't really work. There we go. I turned it off. Perfect. There we go. Now, now I'm like feeling really Pentecostal because I got a microphone in my hand. I can't do that evangelical ear thing anymore. All right, anyway. So John is an older man, and he's writing his story uh, about the life of Jesus. And he, he thinks back to this conversation Jesus had with a guy named Nicodemus. And he, he's, he's remembering how Jesus was telling him that to, 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 to know God, to come into relationship with God is like being born again. And then, and then as John's writing, he gets to the end of the conversation, and he's thinking and reflecting back on a whole life lived in relationship with Jesus. And he's thinking about how 
the words of Jesus have just changed his life. And so he adds this commentary at the end of the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And we all know the verse, John 3, 16. So John starts off and he says, For God so loved the world. John says, John, John sits there and he's thinking about this conversation and he says, man, God was so motivated by love. God was so driven by this love and preoccupation with the world. Now, most of us, this is a completely foreign idea to us that this God exists. Because if we were John and we were reflecting on everything that we had experienced and everything that we knew and what we thought we knew about God, we would say, for God so hated the world, wouldn't we? For God, for God was so disappointed at the failings of the world, for God was so annoyed at their inability to get it right, for God was so frustrated by how many times they failed. John says, no, 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 none of that. For God so loved the world. This God, John tells us, he says, this God is a God of love revealed by Jesus that he so loved the world, John goes on and he says, that he gave his one and only son. You see, Christmas is about the giver and it's also about the gift. John, John tells us, he said, God was so so preoccupied with the world and so motivated by love that he gave because love like that cannot stay hidden. Because you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And God loved, so God gave. He had to act because that's what his love does. And, 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 and this Christmas, I've really enjoyed telling my kids about how my mom would trick us. Uh, when she would wrap our presents. My mom was a trickster uh, because she loved us and she wanted us to be surprised on that day. So my brother and I, I don't know if you ever did this as a kid. My brother and I, we would, like when my mom would bring out the presents and lay them under the tree, we would start going through and finding our name and then we would pick up a present and we would shake it. We'd smell it, you know, we'd... <laughs> How much we get the scales? How much does this weigh? You know, like this one's heavy. I want this one. You know, we would. Anybody ever do this? You ever peel back the corner to try to look at the box? We do that all the time. So my mom got hip to it, right? And she she got she got tricky. She's sneaky. She's very very sneaky. She would. So okay, fellas, you understand this? You know how it's like sometimes, like most of the time, Christmas you have you open a package and it's socks and underwear, right? Like, all right, thanks, good, check that off the list, awesome. So my mom would do that, except she would take the socks and underwear, she would put them in a box, and then she would take like two cans of cream corn and put in the box with the socks and underwear. Or she would like she would take something and then she would put a, a jar with popcorn kernels in it. So we would shake it and it would make noise or we'd pick it up and be like, this is heavy. And then we open it up. Of course, it's like socks and underwear. <laughs> she would go, like she would spend hours doing stuff like this. Why? Because, because it was all about the gift. Because Christmas, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Christmas is all about the gift. Yes. Yes. Christmas is absolutely about gifts because every gift points to the ultimate gift. For God so loved the world that he gave. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says, For to us a child is born, and to us what? A son is given. 800 years before Jesus would be born in Bethlehem by Mary, Isaiah's writing about the gift, and he's telling us, hey, Christmas is all about the gift. And every gift that you and I receive points to that gift. And so in the midst of Amazon Prime and Black Friday and waiting on your shipment and tracking and all that <laughs> stuff, and you're watching and you're like, it's got to get here before Christmas Eve. Don't miss the fact that Christmas is about the gift. It's about the giver and it's about the gift. And if that was it, if John stopped there and instead of a comma, he put a period, that's good news, man. Like that's good news, but he doesn't. John doesn't even stop there. Look, he keeps on going. So he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son and then look what he says. He says that whoever believes in him. So Christmas is about the giver. Christmas is about the gift. But Christmas is also about the response. John says that God loved, so God gave. 
And then he says, if, if you and I, whoever, whoever, and no, none of us are, inclu- are excluded, right? Because this is good news of great joy for all people. So whoever believes in. Now, this is interesting. Because growing up in church, I, I kind of thought it was believes that. You know what I mean? Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, Ken, I'm going to borrow your stool real quick. So a lot of times the message of Jesus that I heard as a kid was like, um, I, I'm going to talk about this stool, but you, you'll follow me, okay? I believe that this stool exists. Right? I believe that it does. I believe that the stool can hold me up if I sit on it. But that's believing that. And John didn't say believe that. John said believe in. I can believe that from a distance. I can believe that and never have to actually engage and and interact with the stool. Because that's a philosophy. But John wasn't writing a philosophy. He was writing a story. He wasn't writing some new statement of belief. But he was writing history. I met this man, Jesus. And if I believe in Well, that's weird. And in fact, John is the very first person in human history to come up with this concept. It's not believe that. It's more like, here's what John, here's how John would illustrate it if he was here today. I can point and say, I believe that that stool will hold me up. Or I can believe in the stool and I can let all the weight come off my legs and I can rest everything that I am in the stool. I believe that it can hold me up. I believe in it to do so. John says, John says, here's the good news. For God so loved the world that he gave his own one and only son, that whoever believes in, whoever trusts in, whoever, whoever stops trusting in their own ability to hold themselves up and keep their weight on this earth and rests everything in Jesus, that person, that's what, that's what believes in looks like. You see, it's not a, it's not a belief system. It's not a, it's not a, 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 it, it, it's not a, uh, an ascribe. John didn't say whoever ascribes to this doctrine. No, he, he just said whoever, whoever trusts in and leans all of their weight upon what Jesus did for them. That person, he goes on to say, he says, he says that person will have, well, will not perish, but has eternal life. You see, the response, the response that we that we have to the gift shows if the gift has found a place in our lives. The way we respond to the gift shows if we have actually received the gift and the gift actually reveals the heart of the giver. And so, so John wants us to know and to understand that we have a responsibility to respond to this gift because, because love calls out for a response. Love cries out for to you and to me. It says, here's this gift. How are you going to respond? And when we, when we do that, when we say, you know what? I'm going to trust in. I'm going to believe in. Because here's the thing. This, that, this, this is default. Trusting in myself. I am my own God. I can make it through life on my own. I got my act together. This is default. This is not default. None of, us, none of us default into this. This is a choice. This is a choice to surrender my complete life to Jesus. This is a choice to, to take all of the weight that I've been trying to hold up on my own and rest it upon the work of Jesus Christ. This is, this is believe in. Not believe that. For many of us, we, we just want to believe that. But John isn't even finished. He says when we do that, we actually receive another gift. There's an exchange that happens. He says, he says whoever does this does not perish. Perish there just means cease to exist. Literally cease to be. Whoever, whoever believes in doesn't cease to be but has eternal life. And eternal life is so much more than going to heaven when you die. 
It's actually, a, it, let's just let Jesus answer that. What is eternal life? John 17, verse 3. This is the words of Jesus. He says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is a relationship. Eternal life isn't, isn't something we look at from afar and admire from a distance. Eternal life is something that we rest upon, or that we rest in. And when you trust in Jesus with your whole life and you surrender everything to him and you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put all my weight upon you, Jesus, you receive this connection with God. You receive this God life. Scripture says that, that when we do this, we become children of God. I'm going to actually ask, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to wrap up this way. I'm going to ask for the, uh, for the band to go ahead and make their way uh, back up here. I thought, you know, we're talking about a complicated Christmas and we want to uncomplicate Christmas. And so I thought, I thought maybe some of you all might be heading into a complicated week. And I just wanted to give you an opportunity and a chance to, to, to pray and, and, and maybe find your way back to God. This is, this is why the angels could say with no qualifiers, nothing like, like this is good news. For all people, because God knew you and I, we would never find our way back to him. We would never find our way back to the stool to actually sit upon it. So driven by love, motivated by his love for you and me, he gave Jesus. Not, not just to forgive, but to be forgiveness for you and I. And he says when we receive him, when we stop trusting in our own ability, when we stop trusting in our own selves, we receive this eternal life. Why, why is that important? Why is it important to trust in God? Because when you're trusting in yourself, you never know when enough is enough. When's enough enough? When have I been good enough? When have I, when have I gotten it right enough? Listen, the whole enough religion, that's complicated. That's difficult. This, this is, this is easy. Jesus is uncomplicated. Christmas is all about the giver, the gift, and the response. God gave. God, God loved, so God gave. When we believe in, we receive. That's the message of Christmas. That's that simple and that straightforward. It's good news. And when you receive it, it causes great joy. And it's for all people. Let me pray for you this morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. We always appreciate hearing how God is moving in your life. We all have a story to tell, and we'd love to hear yours. Please visit verticalchurch.tv and click on the little pencil icon called Amen Corner to tell us your story. Also, if you'd like to support the ministry of Vertical Church financially, you can do so by clicking the giving link at verticalchurch.tv. Thank you again for taking the time to join us as we point those far from God to life in Jesus.